Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this redgamingtech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to start things out with a couple of leaked results for the Ryzen 7 3700X. They are from Passmark, and they look extremely impressive indeed. So, let's take a look. So, of course, Passmark's uh, online database for results is cpubenchmark.net. And starting out with the high-end CPU results, so the Ryzen 7 3700X scores 23,557 points. So it's clearly not enough to put it at the very top of the table, but it does score very favorably. Remember, the 3700X is the slower of the uh, eight core processors from AMD, and furthermore, uh, it well, obviously, uh, AMD will be releasing uh, much higher core count CPUs in the new uh, Matisse lineup anyway. But uh, this type of result does put it rather favorably in competition with CPUs such as AMD's own second generation Threadripper as well. But we also have, perhaps more interestingly, at least in my opinion, uh, the single thread performance of this particular processor too. And obviously, these are only leaked results, so obviously this would be someone who has done a benchmark because they've gotten the process and oops, I forgot to unplug the Ethernet cable after doing like drive updates, that type of thing. I did cover the fact that the Ryzen 5 3600 currently has the highest single thread performance. It's scoring almost 3000 points, which is extremely impressive, although of course we don't know what setup they are using for uh, these systems. The Ryzen 7 3700X scores 2,876 points. So basically, with the obvious uh, discrepancies in system configuration, single thread performance in this one specific benchmark, which is important to remember, AMD do look very competitive with CPUs such as the 9700K and of course the i9 9900K. Later on in this video, we're going to be going through the results of the RTX 2060 and RTX 2070 now that the embargo for reviews has been lifted. But it is very favorable for NVIDIA currently in the desktop market. It's hard to argue that with the super launch, it's going to put AMD under an immense amount of pressure. So a lot of people are wondering what will happen when Intel finally launch their XE line of cards, which unfortunately is going to have to wait until next year. But we actually have a couple of updates concerning Intel's XE line of GPUs, so let's go through them. So judging from rumors that are circulating currently around the internet, the second generation of Intel's XE cards will be the GPUs which support hardware-based ray tracing, and it will not be in the first generation of XE. So it, XE will be used for multiple different usage scenarios. We will, of course, get ver variants for gamers, and we will also see prosumer versions as well as cards for the data center. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there, whether, for example, we're going to get hardware ray tracing or a variant thereof for, let's say, the data center or for prosumers, and then maybe Intel feel like it's not quite ready yet for the limelight on for the gaming side of things, or whether there's going to be uh, some kind of like halfway solution. And then what actually happens with the hardware based hardware based excuse me uh, ray tracing and see what type of performance impact we get versus Nvidia and also AMD's own uh, hybrid ray tracing. This report also tells us that once again in 2020 the variant of XC, which of course will be the first generation, will be based on the 10nm architecture. Although we already knew then, of course, and the second generation is going to launch a year later and it will be using 7nm. Also, during the International Supercomputing Conference, Intel did divulge a detailed plan for its graphics card roadmap, and it would appear that with the second generation of GPUs, they will support uh, 7nm, and also they will be utilizing both EMIB and Foveros. Uh, I've actually gone rather in-depth uh, regarding both EMIB and Foveros previously, so if you need a refresher of what that is, feel free to search it on the channel. 
and those will be mixed into the architecture for the second generation release. There were actually a couple of very interesting rumours uh, late last year, if memory serves, regarding XE, and they were actually started by Ashraf, who used to work over at The Motley Fool, but now, ironically enough, he actually works at Intel themselves. But anyway, Ashraf actually told us that uh, this was via Twitter, and it's worth noting that those uh, tweets have now been nuked from the internet, but you can search for them still, and uh, some people have actually screenshotted them, and they can be like found on various message boards. But basically, the synopsis is that from what Ashraf had been told via leaks, the uh, XE line of cards for the higher end would be split into multiple GPU dies, and they would basically be pieced together to create a more powerful whole. And basically, it's going to almost be like a chiplet strategy for the GPUs. And from what he had been told from folks within Intel's graphics division, which had start, uh, started, excuse me, rather small back then, and then obviously recently they've expanded quite significantly their team size, that Intel were targeting uh, better than market leading performance. So in other words, uh, Intel were not just like, oh, we're gonna be targeting, you know, around what Nvidia are doing, but instead they want to come in as hard as possible and try to defeat Nvidia with the first wave of cards. And obviously that would be quite the, that would be quite the statement to provide to the market, right? I mean, imagine Intel's first wave of GPUs is at the very least as fast as Nvidia. And there is a lot of movement at the moment from Intel regarding things such as One API, which is new programming, which allows you to more seamlessly create uh, applications which address both GPU and CPU. And I did have a couple of discussions with Chris Hook at uh, GDC. You can find uh, those interviews on the channel as well. And ultimately, a lot of the stuff is very cool in terms of theory. It's down, of course, to Intel to be able to execute this and to be able to actually see a physical product in our hands and be able to test it. I'm very much looking forward to having a third competitor in the market because I think that's going to be great for us as consumers, much like how it's awesome at the moment that AMD are competing in the CPU arena, and it's obviously put an immense amount of pressure on Intel. And one can argue that Intel was sleeping uh, for the past several years, which I don't think many of us would disagree is largely down to a fault of some of the upper management. But now Intel have started to awaken. The problem is it's clearly going to take them a couple of years to be able to catch up. So it's going to be really curious in terms of the graphics anyway, what happens uh, over the next couple of years and what actually occurs in terms of solutions for the data center. One advantage both Intel and AMD do possess is that they also have the ability to bundle and create solutions which also include x86 processors, whereas uh, NVIDIA do not have that ability. But obviously that hasn't really stopped them currently. It's not like they're um, not a driving force in the data center market, for example. So it'll be really... Uh, I think the landscape's going to be very different in a couple of years. Anyway, speaking of NVIDIA, I want to give my thoughts real quick regarding the RTX 2060 and 2070 launch. I do want to hold off to a larger degree until we see uh, the RX 5700 as well as 5700 XT launch, but I do want to give a couple of initial thoughts and feelings regarding this. So, when, X, uh, when XT and the vanilla card was announced by AMD, a lot of people did hope that the cards would be a little bit cheaper, but it was justified because if you looked at the performance, it was a little bit higher, at least judging from the benchmarks that we've seen from AMD themselves, although they do seem to be backed up by leaked benchmarks, that it was a bit faster than both the 2060 and 2070 respectively. I did actually leak that there was going to be a refresh of some variant of Turing, although my leak was not as comprehensive as what the reality was. I originally said that we were going to see faster memory variants, but eventually that didn't turn out to be 100% accurate. With the 2080, we see faster memory variants for the Super, but for the 2060 and 2070, which is going to be the focus I'm going to have right now, uh, they didn't actually really increase memory speeds or anything like that. Well, technically speaking, I guess they did with the 2060. We'll get into that in a moment. Instead, they really just bumped up the specifications of the GPUs. And it's fair to say that the performance of these cards is drastically increased compared to the original launch. So now what we have is the 2060 Super, 
which for all intents and purposes in terms of raw specifications and performance is real close to the 2070. And then we have the 2070 Super, which guess what? Yeah, that's right. It's very close to that of the 2080. And pricing's really interesting as well with the 2070 Super essentially replacing that of the 2070 and the 2060 Super will remain on store shelves along with the 2060 so they're not going anywhere instead nvidia are going to charge a uh, 50 us dollar price premium for the 2060 super which i think if you've got the extra 50 dollars i would say that it's heavily worthy of your purchase not just because of the extra cuda course we'll get into that in just a moment but also because nvidia have bundled in an extra two gigabytes of gddr6 memory and in addition to this have increased the memory bus from 192 bits to 256 bits of glory which is clearly going to make a massive difference in both memory bandwidth when you're increasing memory bandwidth by like 33 percent clearly if you're increasing memory bandwidth so significantly plus adding an additional two gigabytes of vram those are things that are definitely going to help future-proof the GPU. So let's have a look very briefly over the specifications of the cards and then also take a look at the performance. The 2060 Vanilla contains 1920 CUDA cores compared to 2176 of the Super. We also see a slight decrease in clock frequency from 1680 to 1650. I'm going to refer to the boost clocks here. Um, but this also does mean that while it does have a small disadvantage in CUDA cores compared to the 2070, it does have a clock speed advantage by 30 MHz. The RTX 2070 Super, meanwhile, has a significant leg up against the 2070. Not only does it have 150 MHz boost advantage, but it also contains 2560 CUDA cores compared to just 2304. So this is really interesting because the 20 70 Super has a 60 megahertz advantage compared to the RTX 2080 despite the fact it has fewer CUDA cores. No, it doesn't quite make up for the lack of CUDA cores, but it does mean it's going to be really, really close indeed. So let's have a look at some performance results then. This is not going to be a comprehensive rundown, but I do want to spark a question for you all. We'll start out with Shadow of the Tomb Raider at the highest quality settings on Anantec and the RTX 2080 Vanilla scores 20, uh, excuse me scores 75.4 frames a second I'm gonna round frames up and down I feel it would probably be the simplest uh, so that's three frames per second faster than the 2070 Super and the 2070 Super stomps I'm sorry but there's no other word to say it over the uh, Vanilla card the Vanilla 2070 and also the 2060 Super in this test anyway is faster than the Vega 64, although we do know that there are ways to increase Vega's performance. You can undervolt it and overclock it, but of course you can then say, well, you can overclock the 2060 Super or 2070 as well, but anyway. So the 2060 Super scores 63 frames a second compared to 56 frames a second with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. That is a significant performance increase uh, for these Super cards. And let's move over to um, do, uh, Metro Exodus, also from Anantec. We're going to focus once again on 1440p because I think it's a good representation of the performance of these GPUs. Ultra quality, no hair work. The 2080 scores 59 frames a second compared to 56 frames a second of the 2070 Super. You're not going to feel that uh, performance. It's, it's basically imperceptible and 50 frames a second for the super card which once again means it pips the vega 64 to the post but also means that the super uh, 2060 is faster than both the 2070 well actually it's a disservice to say it's faster than the 2060 because it is significantly faster than the 2060. starting things out with far cry 5 on tech power up and we have uh, the RTX 2060 Vanilla scoring 81.7 frames per second. The Super variant scores 92 frames a second. So that's significant. It's 10 frames per second faster for Super, which also means that the Super and the RTX 2070 essentially are within spitting distance of one another. Once again, I would say that if a game is unplayable or plays well on 
the 2070, it's going to be basically identical for the 2060 Super. And as for the 2070 versus the 2070 Super, once again, around 10 frames per second difference, which means it's not quite uh, as impressive as some of the other games compared to the 2080 uh, vanilla card, but it's really impressive indeed. We'll finish our look at the benchmarks uh, with Shadow of War because this application absolutely loves VRAM. In fact, it makes a significant difference uh, to minimum frame rates when you have lots more VRAM. But the 2060 6GB, once again on tech power up, uh, scores 59.5 uh, frames a second. Let's just call it 60 uh, FPS. And we have a 12 FPS advantage for the Super Cards, which once again within spitting distance of the RTX 2070 vanilla and the RTX 2080 uh, sorry 2080 scores uh, 90 frames a second compared to 84 of the RTX 2070 super it's hard to argue that Nvidia have essentially reduced the cost for performance from the Turing lineup Basically, if you were going to pick up an RTX 2070, you can now just pick up an RTX 2060 Super and get much the same performance. Likewise, for the same price as a RTX 2070 on launch, you can now get essentially RTX 2080 performance. This is both good and bad. From the perspective of someone who hasn't yet jumped into Turing, it's great. But if you've just recently purchased one of the Turing cards, it's certainly going to be a bit of a kick in the shin. Fortunately, a couple of companies are actually offering trade-in programs, and honestly, if you've just recently purchased one of these cards, uh, I would suggest, if you can, taking back the vanilla GPUs and picking up one of these new ones. Don't forget that the uh, older cards are now going to be going EOL, or at least the 2070 and 2080. The 2060 will be coexisting with the Super Variant. And so I'm going to pass the question off to you all, how do you feel that this affects AMD? Do you feel that this is going to make AMD change its mind in terms of the pricing for the 5700 and 5700 XT? I wouldn't be surprised if AMD decide to remain steadfast for the short term in terms of the pricing and then reduce the price later on. But it's going to be a really tall order for AMD to ask these prices. Another possibility is that we don't see an official price cut, but instead uh, there are lots of rebates available, which essentially means that you get the GPU for a cheaper price. But hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then the normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.